So let's start off by John chapter 13. You should already be in John with the Bible reading. But let's look at John chapter 13. And leading up to his, uh, leading up to his death, you remember he gathered together with his disciples and they were having uh, the Last Supper. So John chapter 13, let's read from verse 4. John 13 verse 4, the Bible reads, He riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. Talking about Jesus Christ. He took off the clothes he was wearing, girded himself with towels. And verse 5, After that he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus saith unto him, He that is washed needeth not, save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. So I just want to bring this attention to you. Before the Last Supper, before they partook of the bread and the grape juice and, and then the crucifixion, following that, Jesus took time to wash the disciples' feet. We've heard that story of Christ washing his feet. Now, I've already preached on this on a Thursday, which was talking about confessing our sins. If you guys might re recall that. I spoke about how when Jesus was washing the feet of his disciples, he was displaying, just like he told um, Simon, uh, let's, let's read verse 10 again, he that is washed, so someone that's saved, someone that's already washed, needeth not. So you don't need to be washed again. You don't need to be saved again, because once you're saved, you're always washed. You're always clean. You're always perfect before the Lord, right? But he says, so you needeth not save or accept to wash his feet. So something as believers that we ought to do, even though we're saved with eternal security, is that we need to wash our feet regularly, okay, on a regular basis. And this is, but he's clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. Now look at verse number eight. What did Jesus say? If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Okay, so this is talking about washing the feet. Okay, this means because, obviously we spoke about this on Wednesday with some of the men, we have a position before God, Positionally before God, we're righteous. Positionally before God, we're, we're uh, without sin because we're in Christ. And Christ sees us, when God sees us, He sees us through the righteousness of Christ, right? But then we have our walk, okay? Our walk with the Lord. And our walk's not perfect. Our walk, you know, we're meant to walk in the Spirit. We're meant to crucify that old flesh, that old man. Okay, but more of, I mean, look, it, it's a battle for all our life. We're going to be battling between that Spirit and the flesh. And in your walk, you're going to do wrong. In your walk, you're going to sin. In your walk, you're going to uh, forget the Lord. And, and uh, you know, uh, but the Lord says, look, that's why I need to wash your feet. Because as you go through life, your feet get dirty. I need, I need to wash that. Because if I don't wash it, you'll have no part with me. And what I, I preached on Thursday, I don't want to preach the whole sermon again, is that part is the fellowship of the Lord. Okay, we're his son. There's nothing wrong with that. Like, like, you know, we said, if your children are obedient, you know, that relationship between father and son always exists. But if that child disobeys the father, wants nothing to do with the, with the family, they might leave and that will break the fellowship. In order for us to maintain a good, clean fellowship with the Lord, a good relationship with the Lord, we need to make sure we confess our sins on a regular basis. Okay, that, that's what I want to bring to your attention, because I will be touching upon this before we take part of the Lord's Supper, take part of the communion. Now turn with me to Luke. Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, verse 19. So following the feet washing, um, if you don't already know, Judas betrayed Jesus Christ. He left to do his dirty work. And then we take look at uh, verse number 19. And he took bread and gave thanks. So Jesus Christ, he taking the bread... And uh, these were during the days of the unleavened bread, leading up to the Passover. And by, by then, you know, they, they weren't eating bread that had leaven or yeast. So when we partake of the Lord's table, we'll be partaking of bread that's without yeast, okay? Unleavened bread. Uh, he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. There it is. He says, look, this, this, you need to do this to remember me. This is an ordinance I'm giving the church 
not just baptism, which is a picture of the death and resurrection of Christ, but the ordinance of communion. Do this, this do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Okay, so this bread, this cup of grape juice that we're going to partake of is to remember his sacrifice. The bread represents his body. He broke that bread. That represents his broken body for us, right? He was a perfect lamb of God. He was without sin, right? He was righteous. And yet his body was broken for us. And then it's the shed blood of the New Testament. The blood that poured when that body was broken. That is the blood of the New Testament. Okay, the, the sacrifice. And look, you say to me, Kevin, why did God have to break a man? Why did he have to bleed this man? You know, I, I don't fully understand all the spiritual connotation with this. But when you think about it, it's an amazing sacrifice. That God himself would come in the form of man, God the Son, and sacrifice his body and his blood for us. Okay? This is why we need to partake of uh, the communion fairly regularly. I, I think, you know, personally, I think once every three months, you know, four times a year, I think is about right. I've been in churches where they do it every month, but I feel like it kind of loses its importance. And then there are some churches that do it every year, um, every year. But you kind of, you know, God, Christ wants us to remember. He says as often, in other places, as often as you do. So oft, often, you know, so it's something that needs to be done regularly. But I want to make sure that, you know, it, there's no right and wrong to that, okay? So, but I'm just saying to you, I think once every three months, Makes pretty good sense, I think. Now, moving on to verse 39. Let's look at the suffering of Christ. Luke, we see in Luke 22, verse 39. And he came out and went. So this is after they had the Last Supper. He came out and went as he uh, was wont to the Mount of Olives. And his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. I just love those words, right? Jesus Christ, knowing what he's about to go through, the sacrifice he's going to do, not just physically, but spiritually, to take on. He becomes sin, remember? He became sin for us. He takes on all the sins that we've ever committed, the worst things we've ever done, the sins of the whole world put upon Christ, the spiritual suffering as well as the physical. And he says, you know, because he was man, remember that, he was a man. He says, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. If there's another way, you know, take this away. You know, this wasn't something he was looking forward to do. Yes, it was his mission. Yes, he knew this goal in his life. Yes, he knew this was going to be the climax of his ministry. But he was thinking, is there, is there another way? But then he realizes, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. The will of the Father be done. Okay, we see the obedient son laying down his life and, and uh, just going with the will of the Father. And, you know, I've said this before, that should be, our, that should be our, our thinking, right? We should be saying, not our will, Lord, but your will be done. And then uh, further on in verse 43, And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. So, that, you know, the Father saw fit to send this angel to help him all right because jesus was struggling at this point and being in agony look at this in verse 44 and being in agony he prayed more earnestly so even before any of the of the beating any of the whipping any of this he's in agony at this point being in agony he prayed more earnestly and that that ought to be a lesson to us right when we're in agony when we're troubled when we're uh you know struggling in our life we ought to pray more earnestly the example of Jesus Christ. And his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling up down to the ground. So he's sweating, he's perspiring, you know, realizing just what he's going to go through. And his sweat is like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Now, look, some people say he was bleeding blood, like he was sweating blood. I don't know if we can really take that from the scriptures. Um, I, just, I just believe it's saying that his sweat was like great drops. He was just perspiring heavily. And, you know, he was literally just, just water was pouring out of him. Okay, it's like great drops of blood. I think just using it as an analogy, I'm not sure if that really was blood or maybe some people have said maybe it was a bit of blood mixed with sweat. You know, a certain condition when someone's greatly stressed, that can happen. I'm not sure. I don't think we can draw that conclusion from there. I just, I personally believe he was just perspiring greatly 
from, from the suffering that he was going to do. So we see even before he's arrested, even before anything takes place, Christ in agony to do the work for us so we can be free. Look at verse 47. And while he yet spake, behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas, so one of his disciples, one of the twelve, went before him and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? Uh, and when they were about him, saw, and sorry, when they which were about him saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? And we won't go into the story, but there was, there was, a, there was, a, there was fighting, right? Uh, some people believe it was Peter that pulled out that sword, cut off, cut off the, one of the soldier's ears. Christ put that, that ear back. But I just want to show you, that what I want to point out to you here is that Christ was betrayed by one of his disciples, one of his close friends. In fact, in another, I can't remember which book, which gospel it is, Christ calls him friend. He goes, friend, you know, you've come to betray me. You know, Christ being betrayed by his close friend, someone that he spent the last three and a half years of ministry with. Yes, Judas was a devil. Yes, a reprobate, if you will. You know, yes, under the influence of Satan. But Christ still saw him as his friend, being betrayed by your friend. All right. Verse 47. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Let's move on from there. Verse 55. Verse 55. And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of a hall, so here, this, this multitude came, they've arrested Christ, they've arrested our God. They've arrested Him, and they're going to bring Him to trial. And then in verse 55, And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall, and were set down together, Peter sat down among them. But a certain maid beheld him, as he sat by the fire, and earnestly looked upon him and said, This man also was also with him. And he denied him. So Peter... This one that said to Jesus, hey, that I will never deny you, right? He denies another friend of Jesus Christ. He's another close friend. This one a believer. This one a saved man. This one someone that Christ was going to use in the future in a mighty way. And he denied him in verse 57, saying, woman, I know him not. And after a little while, another saw him and said, thou art also of them. And Peter said, man, I am not. Man, I am not. And about the space of one hour, after another, uh, confidently affirmed, saying, Of a truth this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately while he yet spake, the cock crew. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out. And wept bitterly. So I just can't imagine what Christ is going through. Like, okay, we see Peter denying the Lord, denying him three times, and then Jesus Christ turns to him, looks at him. You know, another friend, another one's turned their back on me. You know, and all the disciples, all the disciples have fled away from Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ he is, is facing this trial alone. Okay? Just think about that being betrayed by your best friends. Let's go to verse 63. And the men that held Jesus mocked him. Mocked him. Okay, the people that took Christ, mocking our Lord God. Okay, making fun of him. Laughing about him. Not taking him seriously. This is the God of the universe, the creator of all things, being mocked by man and smote him. Beat him. Hit him. That's what it means to smite, to smote, is to, to hit him. Jesus Christ being mocked, being beaten. <clears throat> and when they had blindfolded him, so they put blindfolds on his eyes, they struck him, so they beat him again, they struck him on the face and asked him saying, prophesy, who is it that smote thee? And many other things, blasph blasph uh, and many other things blasphemously spake they against him. So just blaspheming Jesus Christ, blaspheming God, beating Him, making fun of Him, mocking Him. These are the things, I mean, obviously, these are, this is not the physical suffering right now, but these are the things that Christ suffered leading up to the cross. And then, uh, if you guys know about the trial, He was taken to the Sanhedrin, brought before Pilate. 
Uh, let's go back to John chapter 19, where uh, Callum read from. John chapter 19. <clears throat> John chapter 19, verse 1. And then after the Sanhedrin, he was taken to Pilate. And I, I apologize, because w- when I think about this, I get emotional. And then I can't get my thoughts right, because I-, I don't like thinking about it. You know, we read about it in the scriptures. We come, sometimes we kind of gloss over it. We get through the chapter. But when I think about the suffering Christ went through, it gets me pretty upset. Chapter 19, verse 1. Then Pilate, therefore, took Jesus and scourged him. So now they take him and they whip him, right? They take Christ and they whip him. And this might be the first time he sheds blood. You know, I mean, you know, Christ, we talk about, you know, shedding his blood on the cross. And yes, he did. But he also shed his blood as they whipped him. They whipped his back. And possibly even because it talks about um, Christ being bruised. So, you know, obviously when you're bruised, there's internal bleeding taking place in your body. So, I mean, Christ, Christ at this stage, he's already losing that blood, that blood that was shed for the New Testament and scourged him. They whipped him. Verse number two. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head and they put, it, put on him a purple robe. So this crown of thorns, guys, you know, just taking these... <laughs> I don't know if you've ever stabbed yourself with a thorn or, or even bindies. Have you ever walked just, just on bindies, just on grass and, and the pain that he has in your feet? They take these thorns, they make this crown out of the thorns, put it upon his head. You know, obviously they'll be cutting into his, his, into his skin. And, you know, if you ever cut your head, that's where you bleed most, mostly from. You know, if you, any, like, I don't know if you know this, but if you cut your head, that's, that's where you're going to bleed the most from. So I can just imagine blood on his face. And then verse 3, And said, and this is again mocking him, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him. They hit him again. This time with the crown of thorns upon his head. They smote him with their hands. So I you know, probably driving those thorns deeper into his flesh. <clears throat> I'll just read to you Isaiah 50, verse 6. It says, I gave my back to the smiters. So this is Christ, the prophecy of Christ, being bitten, uh, beaten, being whipped. And my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. Now this is not something you're going to read in the New Testament, but you read about this in the Old Testament. And my cheeks in that plucked off the hair so that Jesus Christ's beard was being ripped off his face as they beat him, as they whipped him. I don't know at what point in his suffering they did this, but they ripped off his beard, off his face. They plucked off the hair. And then it says this in Isaiah 56. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. So spitting in his face as well. We don't read about that in the New Testament, but the Old Testament gives us further indication of the suffering that he went through. Now if you can go back to Luke 23. Luke 23. Luke 23, verse 33. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, where they crucified him. So they've taken him to Calvary now, crucifying him. Remember his whipped? Remember his his back is, is, is destroyed from the whipping. Then they would take him and place him on that cross with his bare flesh bleeding against that, you know, that wood, the splinters or whatever he's going to have in his, 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 his back is an open wound. You know, they crucified him. The nails through his hands, the nails through his feet, the crown of thorns put upon him, remember that. And the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, look at Jesus Christ, just his, his grace and his mercy. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and, and cast lots. <coughs> so obviously, you know, the Jews, you know, the Romans, they put him on the cross. <coughs> and we see Jesus Christ forgive them. You know, just the same as us, you know. He, he, he went to the cross for our sins. And Christ says, forgive them. You know, we believe on Christ. Forgive them. <clears throat> uh, 
<clears throat> verse 35, And the people stood beholding. The people look, watching him. And the rulers also with them derided him. So the rulers here are mocking him, deriding him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he be Christ, the chosen of God. So you have the rulers of Israel mocking him, deriding him. Verse 36, And the soldiers also mocked him. So the soldiers, they put him on his cross, they're mocking him as well, coming to him and offering him vinegar and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. Just, just making a mockery of him. And I'll just read to you Matthew 27, verse 44. So you know Christ was crucified with the malefactors. Now the Bible calls them thieves. One on the right hand, one on the left. And then I'll read to you Matthew 27, verse 44. The thieves also, the thieves also, the same guys that are being crucified, who are about to die themselves, the thieves also, which were crucified with him, cast the same in his teeth. So they also just, just mocking Christ. These two thieves on the cross, mocking him. Now you're in Luke 23, look at verse 39. So they, they both, I don't know if you knew this, you know, we know the story of the thief on the cross that turned to Christ, but he was mocking Christ as well, it was both of them doing this. And then verse 39, and one of the malefactors, <clears throat> which were hanged, railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, So now, now he's rebuking him. He's finally realized, hey, this Christ, this is someone else. This is something special. You know, rebuked the other thief, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? This guy's realized, you know what, we need to fear God. We're about to enter into his presence. And we're being crucified. We deserve to be on this cross. We're thieves, we've done wrong. And we indeed justly, verse 41, and we indeed justly, saying, look, it's just for us to be crucified. For we receive the due reward for our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. He's realized that Christ is righteous, that he's got no sin, that he's perfect. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. This is his great prayer. You know, is he going, Lord, thank you for dying on the cross for me. You know, please, you know, recognize that I'm a sinner. I mean, obviously he's capturing all of that in what he's saying to the other thief. He's saying, I am a sinner. I deserve to be on this cross. And he know, recognized that Jesus is perfect. Right? He's putting his faith on Christ. This guy's not going through some, you know, magic prayer for salvation. He just says what he thinks. Remember me. He says, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. That's all he knows. That's all he knows what to say. He might not know the great theology of the Bible and the scriptures, but he knows I can trust Christ. I can put my faith on Christ. And I know that he's going to enter into his kingdom. At this point, he recognizes that this is the Messiah. This is the King of Kings. That Christ has a kingdom. You know, he's got the crown of thorns put upon him. But he looks at Christ and he realizes, no, the crown, he is a king. Okay? And he's sacrificed there. He's on that cross. He goes, no, he's got a throne. And I want to be part of that kingdom. Verse 43. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Again, just, just the love of Christ. This thief that was mocking him. Right? I mean, if, if, if you're at the point of death, you know you've done nothing wrong. This guy is just mocking you. And then he seeks your forgiveness. I mean, it'd be hard for me to I'd just be like, go to hell. Right? But Christ, in his mercy and love, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And this is the same thing Christ says to us. You know, we're, on, we're all on the way of death. We were all on the way to hell. We we're all going to pay for our sins. And we've just turned to Christ. And he's, he's said the same words to us. Today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Spiritually, but then one day in the future, physically as well. What an amazing thing. <clears throat> and then uh, look at verse 44. And it was about the sixth hour and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Now the sixth hour, the sixth hour, just trying to get my, my, my thoughts on this, uh, just in case I say anything wrong, I don't want to do that. But if you, if you guys know, um, according to God, he starts, you know how it says the evening and the morning were the first day? We read about that in, in well, the, the new day starts with the evening. When the sun sets, that's the new day, okay? But I don't want to, uh, anyway, so this was sometime in the afternoon 
And so the sun should still be out, but everything turns to darkness. And then it says here, And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. So God has nothing more to do with this Old Testament temple. Okay? At this point in time, that temple had that veil, which was the Holy of Holies, and only the great high priest could enter into that Holy of Holies once a year. Okay? But now that, that veil was rent, God has nothing more to do with this system of the Old Testament system. We have the blood of the New Testament being poured out. The New Testament is about to be brought forth, which is available through Christ and not through. Not, not, uh, the Old Testament was to be done away with at this point. Verse 46, And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, and he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. So we have the death of Christ here. Christ controlled his own death. Christ controlled his own death. He said, now is the time. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. And he gave up the ghost. Right? And by the way, there's no difference there between spirit and ghost. Do you see that? He says, I commend my spirit. And then it says he gave up the ghost. That's why it's fine to call the Holy Ghost the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. It's the same thing, the spirit and the ghost. So we have the death of Christ. And that's what we're remembering tonight. Okay? As a church, we're remembering his sacrifice. The shedding of his blood. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, yeah, just my apologies, I get emotional. <laughs> I've preached on the, on the sacrifice of Christ in other churches and I, I get choked up all the time. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 27. So we're going to read from verse 27 to verse 32. Wherefore, Whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily. I want you to pay attention to those words because this is very important. So if we, if we partake of the bread and of the cup of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. So before we partake of the bread and of the cup, the Bible, or, or we're instructed to examine ourselves. Okay, are we un unworthy to partake of that cup? Now, there's a few ways to, to sort of understand what it means to be unworthy. Okay, but number one should be obviously be you ought to be saved. Okay, because if you're not saved, you're unworthy. Okay, we're only worthy before the Lord if we're in the righteousness of Christ. If we're in Christ positionally before God, that what's, that's what makes us perfect, uh, to make, makes us worthy. Okay, we know we're not perfect. I know that, but in Christ, as far as God is concerned, that's what makes us worthy before Him, is that we are saved. So someone that is unsaved would be very foolish to partake of the bread and of the cup. Uh, verse 29, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So being damned, being condemned, I mean, that's talking about hell, Right? So this is why it's very important that someone is saved before they partake of the bread and of the, of the cup. Now, I know which of my kids are saved, so they're going to partake of that. But our parents, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure, you know, you guys know if your kids are saved or not. So I'll, I'll let you decide whether they should partake of this or not. Because I would not want this damnation to come upon themselves, okay? I don't want this, this curse to fall upon them. Uh, verse 30. For this cause, so for this cause, for, for drinking and partaking of this bread unworthily, for this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. That's many die. Many have died. So some have gotten weak, some have gotten sick, some have died for being unworthy in partaking of the Lord's table. For if we should judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Okay, because obviously the world is referring to the unsaved at that point. But I just want you to notice another thing here. It's not just being saved that makes you worthy to partake of this. Because it talks about here in verse number, uh, verse number 32, but when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. Okay, we are chastened of the Lord. Now I'll read to you Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6 to 10. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6 to 10. i just turn on the lights. Which is the right light? That one. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6 to 10. 
But whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourges every son whom he receiveth. So even though we're saved, we can be chastised by the Lord, right? Okay, so there's more to being, to being worthy than just being saved. Verse 7, if ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the, Lord, whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. So God doesn't chastise uh, the unsaved. He does curse them, okay? But not his sons, his sons are chastised. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chasten us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. So when the Father chastises us, he does it for our profit, not for his pleasure, but for our profit so we can grow and be better Christians and learn from our mistakes. My point is, in order for you to be worthy, number one, you ought to be saved, but number two, you need to have a clean account before the Lord. Okay, a clean account before the Lord. Why do I say that? Because when we looked at Christ and the washing of the feet, remember? He came and washed the feet before they partook of the Lord's Supper. Before they partook of that Last Supper, he made sure their feet were clean. They were already saved, but they had to make sure their sins were confessed before God. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. The Bible reads, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I want you guys to understand this very clearly because I don't, I don't want you, first of all, obviously if you're unsaved, I don't want this damnation to come upon you. But if you are saved, I don't want Christ having to chastise you, right? For not partaking of the Lord's table worthily. So what makes you worthy? Number one, salvation. Number two, confessing your sins to Christ. Now, I've part, part, you know, taken part of the Lord's table in different churches and what have you. Quite often, um, people will be fearful of this. And, and rightly so. We should have a healthy fear of the Lord. But to the point where, you know, instead of taking the bread and taking the juice, they refrain and say, no, you know, I'd just rather not because I don't want to be chastised by the Lord. Because obviously they've got some sin in their life. They've got some unconfessed issues that they need to deal with. But here's the thing. Before we partake of it, I'm going to have a time of silent prayer. And that's your perfect opportunity because we we, none of us are without sin, right? I mean, if we're, we've probably sinned today. I can't think right now what sins I've done. Maybe, probably have, right? Sin today. All we need to do is confess it, right? Let me read it to you again. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So all God asks from us is for us to confess, Christ, you know, God, I'm a sinner. I've done wrong. These are things that I've, I've still yet confessed to you. Please forgive me. And He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. It, it, it's not a complicated thing, right? So if you think, man, you know, I shouldn't partake in case I get chastised by the Lord. You know what? We'll have a time of silent prayer. You guys just confess your sins before the Lord, have your feet washed, and that way when you partake of the Lord's table, when you partake of communion, you can make sure that you're partaking worthily and not unworthily. Okay? God doesn't make it complicated for us. It's something He wants us to partake of and remember His shed blood and His broken body. Okay, let's pray.